welcome back to the Novel Tea Podcast. My name is Alexandra. I'm Emily. And we really enjoy reading books and drinking tea. What are we drinking today? We are drinking um, Twining's Darjeeling. Loose leaf. Loose leaf. We actually had we had a teapot out, mm -hmm. boiled some water. We did this the old timey way. That's right. And it's delicious. And thank you. Thank you so much for making this, some This one tea. came all the way from London. Mm -hmm. It's... You can never go to the Twining's original storefront, which opened like over 300 years ago. It is, is an experience. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's so tiny that you can actually like almost touch the walls. It's like this little tiny shop that was snug in between two large buildings and it's, they, they decided to keep the original one and it's so adorable. That is the most British thing I've heard ever. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, for people who like tea, it's kind of like a little like mecca that you have to do. But today we are speaking of Britishy things. Yes. We're talking about popular books that happened on the internet, gained popularity, either came out this year or just had a resurgence this, this year, year. Right. To wrap up the year, some of which we really loved, some of which we didn't, some of which are throwbacks, some of which are new. Some of which we disagree with the internet. Yeah. The internet can be wrong, people. That's right. <laughs> and since we kicked it off with Britishy stuff, why don't you kick us off with our British author? Yeah, so this has been my year of Janice Hallett, who I think most people know her for The Appeal, which I think is her biggest hit. Although it's been out the longest of mm -hmm. all of her books. The first one that came out which in this style. style. Yeah, which I have to like thank you for because you were the first person who brought up The Appeal to me and you're like, oh, it's really popular on the internet right now. And you showed me some of the inside and I was like, well, yeah, I bought it. I haven't read it yet. I haven't it, finished it. It's yeah. To like make this clear, I don't really read physical books because it's really difficult for me to like sit down and actually read a book, right. you know, like I prefer audiobooks so I can clean the house while I'm, you know, reading books. Yeah. <laughs> but I read all of these this year and this one is the Christmas one. So this is like December 1st. Yeah. We're sitting down and oh, probably and reading the whole thing. cover. I, I was not going to wait until next year when they put out <laughs> the soft cover. Yeah. I was like, well, no. The really like what I've loved about these books is, so they are like basically true epistolary novels. Mm -hmm. We've talked before about like, how to do it po poorly and some yeah. of the limitations of that structure. Yeah, like there have been so many attempts at epistolary novels that are kind of just like, nobody writes a letter like that. That's <laughs> not very realistic. But these are some of the most like true examples of like how an epistolary novel should actually yeah. read. So for like the appeal, the entire thing is basically email and text message con correspondence between the different characters. So these are all mysteries or thrillers. And this one especially is a like a very pretty traditional English mystery mm -hmm. of a small town where a murder happens and it's a very closed community. Mm -hmm. And basically that makes everybody a suspect because you know everybody's involved with everybody's lives. So the whole thing is just their emails and their text messages and like some like random flyers from the local like community board. And it is written in such a way where like, I feel like this style for me makes it so much more intense mm -hmm. and just like got me going so like I could not yeah. put this down like it just got me so like <laughs> to be to show this way uh, I got this when we were I was on vacation in England um, and we were traveling from England to France so I read this in England by the time I got to France I was like, well, I need the next book. So I went to the first English bookstore I got. I did not know that this wasn't even out in the U.S. yet. So I got very lucky. So then I would read this by the time we made it back to the United States. <laughs> and then it was like two months later this came out. So that had to be picked up. So yeah, to me, they're very, very fast paced novels just because, you know, you're cutting out anything that really like any description, any like narrative. It's just people talking to mm -hmm. each other. And I think that creates like a very intense yeah. reading situation and mm -hmm. gets you like captured really like in the moment because mm -hmm. you're very much like in like the people like you know angry text messages to mm -hmm. each other and going back and also like that's very I feel like like relatable mm -hmm. like you know a lot of times you read a book and you're like well that's interesting but I don't relate to that but we all relate to like sending text messages to each other where I'm like what are you doing yeah <laughs> you know and I'm gonna put a period on the end so no. I know exactly how angry there's I am. There's gonna be some exclamation points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So I feel like the way these are written are very like relatable to how we communicate right. in the 21st century. Each book is slightly different in the mm -hmm. way it does epistolary. Mm -hmm. So like the mysterious case of the Alpha and Angels is actually like mostly transcripts mm -hmm. of conversations 
like main narrator is like a journalist and so a lot of times she's like recording her interviews that she's mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. and so it's all like that and then of course there are like notes in between like her and her editor as she's like being like oh I'm you know I have this book I want to write and these are the you know so she's emailing mm -hmm. her editor she's emailing her like agent yeah. so that's kind of a, a you know different mm -hmm. Format. In this case, this is like two um, lawyers who are researching the case. Right. This is so you do have a little bit of that frame where every once in a while the conversation of those, those two, two comes lawyers in. comes in. Yeah. Whereas like with this one, it's a journalist who's investigating a cold case mm -hmm. um, because she wants to write a book about it. Right. And so she's like interviewing the different, you know, potential suspects and that sort of thing. Twine Fruit Code is really hard to describe. It is a pretty wild format it's basically a man who probably like in his late 50s just got released from prison mm -hmm. and he has this like vague memory from childhood that something terrible happened to him when he was in school yeah and having just been released from prison and kind of feeling like his he's like basically has no life he's like a 50 year old man like he doesn't know his children. He doesn't, he, you right. know, he's estranged from his wife. He hasn't seen her since he went to prison. You know, he can't really get a job because you know, right. he's a, and so he kind of starts to obsess on this like kind of partial memory he has as a child mm -hmm. and starts like trying to find people from his past, trying to like research, you know, different things that could relate to that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's all kind of wrapped up in this children's book that he found as a little boy that he's convinced you know, is more than just a children's book. There's mm. the author trying to like say something to him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's all three of these kind of go in like different, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like directions, like the appeal, much more traditional murder mystery, right. um, Appleton angels, more like true crime feeling, mm -hmm. even though it's not really a true crime, it's like written as like an investigation into a true right. crime. And then the time for code is just kind of like, kind of a little off the rail, especially towards the end. You're just like, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened here? Like, it, that one, the Twain Code was like really, really different. Yeah. And I got very, um, like, it took me a little bit longer to get into it because, you know, I'm not on vacation anymore. I'm having yeah. to do real life. But by the time I got like halfway through, I was like, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to stay up real late on a work night to finish this because mm -hmm. we can't let that go. And it's yeah. like literally like within the last 30 pages, the entire novel just takes this like hard left turn and it's just like, well, you got me. <laughs> Pretty good. So I'm very excited about the Christmas appeal. Yes. Um, even though it's just obviously a fun little tiny book, you yes. know, it's, it's my, but it's actually all of the books she's read. Yes. Um, are written. So now I'm like, well, I'm going to have to like wait a year because she is an English author and books are usually released in England. And then it takes like a year to get to the United States. I'm just like, why? Well, Why? <laughs> there are places online where you can get British books and I can hook you up with You're some websites. You're going to need to because yeah. I'm not going to be able to wait for like yeah. two years for another yeah. book from her. This is definitely a case of a popular internet author that I'm just like, yes, yeah. you deserve this popularity. Yeah. There are plenty of authors and we're going to talk about those yeah. who I'm just like, Why? Why are you popular? I don't yeah. understand. But this is one of those few cases where I can definitely, I think in part, um, it's because it's so kind of a fresh appeal to mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so unique in its style mm -hmm. that I think it stands out in and of itself for that and mm -hmm. for being much more interesting way of storytelling than we've kind of gotten yeah. into like some formats of, you know, <laughs> very consistent, you know, and there's nothing wrong with the consistent, but I feel like because we've been in that format for so long in the style of popular that like it's beginning to be a little bit like tired. It's well, like, yeah, like people aren't taking the effort to make it interesting because mm -hmm. like, well, tried and true, like narrative format, first person, male and female, mm -hmm. chapter to chapter change. And it'll be, mm -hmm. you know, as popular as the last time it was done. It's like, right. well, will it, yeah. you know? So I think that's part of mm -hmm. why these books are so popular is that it's just in the midst of that throw these things in there and they are so different than mm -hmm. what I've seen a lot of like books that are popular on the internet that are not anything like this. Yeah. So I understand why they're very popular, but also it's just nice that they're different popular. Yeah. I mean, they're also very well written, yeah. you know, like it's very easy for something to stand out just for the sake of doing something different. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like 
that's all it's standing mm-hmm. on. It definitely yeah. is very, the mysteries are excellent. Right. You know, and it's been a long time since I've read a modern mystery novelist and mm-hmm. been like, wow, that's, that's so, cause so many, so many mystery novels are, are also just trying to be the next Agatha Christie mm-hmm. and they're, you know, just taking on her format. Oftentimes they're taking on her exact settings, right? You know, they're not, they're not really bringing anything new to the genre. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, it is in its own way a stilted genre. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad genre, but mm-hmm. it is often, you know, well, a genre- body as, as six yeah. suspects, you yeah. know, a second murder, a third of the way through, you know, like yeah. there. And all genres have their constraints. That's what makes right. them genre fiction versus just liter- even literary fiction has its own constraints. Even speculative fiction has its own constraints. That's what makes it fall into those various right. categories. And those constraints can help us create new innovation, but they can also be stifling. And I think what you're saying here is that these books are very innovative while also working within those constraints of what makes a good right. mystery novel. Well, and I also appreciate with each book, mm-hmm. she takes a different term. Right. Especially with like the popularity of the appeal, mm-hmm. I could very easily, and I was kind of honestly expecting this, see her doing like all of her books take place in an English village with, you know, a closed community. Mm-hmm. And I was like willing to give that a try. And mm-hmm. then, you know, I picked up the Alpha's and Angels and it's like, way off left field from that and I was like well this is fantastic yeah. you know and that's brave yeah in in the publishing like atmosphere we have where mm-hmm. you know so many authors and publishers are like book one was really popular so do it again yeah let's make book 1.2 right you know and I think it's really brave for her and her publisher honestly mm-hmm. to be like okay well the appeal is popular let's write something entirely different yeah you know I I really really appreciate that and mm-hmm. that's what kept me like coming back for the next one next one because Mm -hmm. honestly each new one even though they all are you know the style is the epistolary style the stories themselves do not have anything to do with each other right they almost exist in like different worlds right except for probably the christmas well i think the christmas appeal is like yeah it's gonna go back to the small community um feel but i also think this is just like a kind of for fun thing i think it's actually supposed to be the same community i think it is yeah yeah it's like they're, they're, the premise is, is that they put on a play, so it's like a, a small community theater. Yeah. That's how they're connected. I mean, and those characters are pretty fantastic. Um, yeah. Honestly, I read, actually, I think it's on the cover of one of them, like that Jenna Salad is the new Agatha Christie. Uh-huh. I'm like, I mean, they both write mysteries. Okay. But I think that's just like a standard, like, you know, oh, she writes good it's mysteries. The, it's the new Beatles, you know. You they know. put that onto every... But honestly, like, yeah. the appeal to me ends on a very Hitchcock note. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just so, like, oh, that's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so, as someone who is primarily an audiobook reader, and then you read a book like this, which is... It's not necessarily multimedia in that sense, but obviously the format of the book is so much about the experience, how you experience the book. You know, I'm imagining that it just doesn't translate the same way in an audio format. Have you tried listening to them? I have not tried because I just can't see how that would function. Unless they got like a full cast of actors. Exactly. And even then, like part of the appeal of them is like, especially for the ones that are like transcripts. Yeah. Often what she'll do is like notes, notes in the margins. Well, notes in the margins, but also like because it's supposed to be like an AI, like you know, creating these things. Like words will be misspelled, mm-hmm. and so your brain is left like trying to figure out what mm-hmm. this person was actually saying, which is like kind of like you know a true life thing where these notes are basically being turned over mm-hmm. to someone who has to transcribe them, and now it becomes almost like a code because this like AI mm-hmm. transcribing has not been that great because you know the audio quality wasn't great, and so this person is trying to figure out what this actually says, and I just don't know mm-hmm. how that could possibly work effectively in mm-hmm. an audiobook. I just feel like you'd miss part of the experience. Mm-hmm of trying to figure out like, Mm -hmm. well, what were they trying to say? Or, you know, there'll be like, oh, audio cuts out here, right? you know? And then, so then you're like trying to like look at the last sentence and look at the first sentence and be like, what? Or like with the appeal, there's a huge cast of characters. And because it's supposed to be like these two lawyers going through, the at the beginning they actually make like a list of the characters and like write a notes. dramatist persona you yeah, might even exactly. say exactly <laughs> i left a bookmark there and kept like flicking back between them being like okay who's this character who's mm-hmm. that character so i know oh, it's their daughter and they're married yeah to this person. like how is this person related to this person yeah. then that's part of the experience of the book and i right. just feel like it would be 
like kind of a half-hearted mm -hmm. experience to not be able to like flip through and be like, oh, wait, wait, I'm having that message relates to this message. Mm -hmm. And you're, I have like multiple bookmarks. And again, mm -hmm. I don't read like this. This mm -hmm. is not how I, I'm just like a push play and like five hours later, you know, <laughs> yeah. the house is clean. <laughs> so do you think it would take another work like this that is just completely revolutionary in its approach to writing books to kind of pull you out of the audiobook land? I actually very, like, I have to have a very specific type of book to want to read it physically. And, like, there are some books, actually, I have this on my list of things to do. Mm -hmm. I read a fantasy novel this year as an audiobook, and I absolutely loved it. It was called The Fox's Tongue and Kieran's Bones. Mm -hmm. But the world building was extremely opaque, which mm -hmm. honestly was what I liked about it. Because mm -hmm. so many fantasy novels are like, here's the world, okay, and now the story. Yeah. You know, which I find to be poor writing and mm -hmm. frustrating, and I don't... Let me have the uh, senior professor of the school explain all of the magic system yes. rules in this very awkward conversation. Yes. And then what happened, professor? Well, but what about this incantation? Oh, paragraph of explanation. It's yes. just like, we could have a little bit more of a creative way of exploring yeah. this world together. But or let's go okay. with like... The people with red hair are called reds, and they live under the surface of Mars, but the people with gold hair are called golds, and they live on the surface. Okay, story. Red Rising, I am looking at you. <laughs> you know? We've already complained about that one. But we will continue. <laughs> Speaking of books that were popular this year, yeah. cheers, Red Rising. Uh, <laughs> or not. <laughs> Anyway, so the, the world building is quite opaque and requires like a lot of thought. And I read it as an audiobook and I really enjoyed it. But I was like, no, I feel like in part, like I'm missing some pieces because you're still always doing something else while you're mm -hmm. reading an audiobook. And so I'm, my plan is to get the physical book and read it again and, you know, mm -hmm. fig see the things that I might have missed before. Like, so those to me, like, mm -hmm. there are books that I feel like are more worthy of the physical book experience and everything. Or even like I've been reading The Historian on mm -hmm. and off and... That book, I read it as an audiobook because sometimes when the book is like 21 hours long, I'm like, I can't <laughs> convince myself to sit down and read that, right? Because I'm just yeah. like, oh, I couldn't possibly. But I also realize with the way that book is written, that needs to be like walks only. Mm -hmm. I can't be, you know, focusing on any other task yeah. while listening to that book because the it story... It requires a lot of your yeah, attention. Yeah, it's, it's so much about like kind of the, the style of the language mm -hmm. and that is what creates the atmosphere that I need to be able to just mm -hmm. focus on that. Right. So yeah, I do think that audiobooks, fantastic, make my reading life so much easier and also just make like day-to-day -day tasks easier. But there is a style of book that's better suited for it than other styles of books. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. So anything else that you wanted to say on Janice Hallett? Hmm. Please read her. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, Janice Hallett. Janice well Hallett. Well done. What, are, what internet popular books are you bringing to us today? Well, to keep it positive, because I have some complaints, I'm going to talk about um, The Song of Achilles, which had a resurgence this year. One of the things that I noticed this year and a little bit last year is that with the rise of book talk, we had a resurgence of several books that were popular in previous years on booktube. And so we had this sort of like second wind on or, them. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of the books we're talking, not necessarily the uh, Janice Hallett, she's mm -hmm. pretty new, but a lot of the books we're going to talk about today have actually been out for a while. Right. And Song of Achilles definitely sits in this category. I think it's an extraordinarily well done book. It's one of the few recent YA books that I've, I would really put my stamp of endorsement on. It is a retelling of the story of Achilles. So it, it goes beyond, you know, what we get in the Iliad, which if you don't remember, the Iliad exists over the course of like about 10 days. So it's a very narrow oh, wow. frame of time. And so we get Achilles from when he's a young man growing up, becoming this great warrior, going to, you know, meeting Patroclus, going to the war and various other experiences. So we really get this expanded view that the author imagines of like what his life might have been like from what we know about different myth sources. About right, him. right. And what we know of like life back mm -hmm. then, that sort of thing. Right. Does it sell like a fairly well researched book in terms of yes. like the background stories? Yeah. So the right, the woman who wrote it is herself a classicist. So she's very well 
uh, first in oh. classical history, and she definitely does a really good job of exploring that and putting that into the story. And even the exploration of Achilles' relationship with Patroclus, which is a romantic one, is, I think, really well done on the page. I think one of the things that is maybe important for people who are really interested in classical history to kind of understand about the one thing that I would say is not accurate, but I understand why she wrote it that way, because it would be, I think, upsetting to read, is that, you know, the Greeks really didn't have the same conception around sexual identity that we do. Right, right. It's a, that's kind of a, a more modern, yeah. in terms of, like, a de- labeling it as an identity. Exactly. And so they definitely, this novel definitely takes a much more modern approach to that. It's important, to, I think, to understand, like, for the Greek world, part of the reason why homosexuality was so accepted was because it was based in this worldview of misogyny, that they mm-hmm. had this concept that you couldn't actually have a relationship of equals between heterosexual couples. Right, right, right. And so, and then, of course, there's lots of sort of military practices around, like, if you look at the Spartans, around their the way that they did homosexuality. Right. And we would not necessarily endorse that sort of thing because it was quite often a much older man with a much younger boy. Um, And so that we would, you know, with our modern concepts of really how you can consent in a relationship like that, we would not be wanting to endorse that sort of thing. And so I think it's important to look at those nuances around how sexuality is conceived in different cultures and different cultures from the past. But overall, the book is really well written. It's really creative. And I do, you know, I really enjoy mythological retellings. Actually, I'm going to go on a soapbox about mythology. Let's do it. Let's get Um, up on that box. Yeah. Which is that I think mythology has a role in society where, you know, by its very function is meant to be retold and is meant to change with time to interact with the culture of its own present tense. And I think that people often get really upset when a famous story gets readapted, whether it be for a movie or, Mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing a lot of classical myths getting retold or fairy tales getting retold in novels. It's a very popular thing right now. Yeah. Some people get a little snippy about it because they're like, you can't change it. And it's like, actually, that's kind of the point of the function of mythology. It says something about the culture it's in. Exactly. And so, of course, we want to, like, honor the origins of the story, but, like, that's how mythology has always worked and folklore has always worked across time. Well, because, I mean, it starts in, like, an oral tradition. 100%. And so, as anything in an oral tradition is going to evolve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. And, and even storytelling to storytelling in its own time. So I read a really interesting paper of um, someone who had gone to study some oral storytellers. I don't remember what culture they were in, um, but they sort of had this concept of what makes the story the same. And the um, scholars, you know, would watch these professional storytellers basically go to different pubs and sort of go through the community. They would like go on these tours and tell the story. And what would happen is like they would hit the major beats of the story. So if you were talking about the Iliad, like there's going to be, you know, the fight between Achilles and Agamemnon. There's going to be uh, Achilles going back to his ship and refusing to fight. There's going to be these various different beats that you're going to hit throughout the story. But how much they expand out the in-between moments or how many lines they take, and a lot of times they're poetical because that makes it easier to memorize, how many lines they take to actually tell various elements is going to expand or contract. So if the audience sort of responds and says like, oh, I want to really hear about the horse of Achilles or something like that, then that you know, they're going to put in 30 more lines about the horse because the audience is responding. So it's this very much a performance art. Right. And that's going to be because it's in conversation with the very, uh, very audience. The audience of the time. Exactly. So if you say, oh, I'm going to do a Robin Hood retelling and in the process of doing a new modern Robin Hood movie, you change the way that the female roles are articulated compared to the medieval myth right. or the medieval folklore story, that's really not necessarily a problem because it's still functioning within what does Robin Hood mean to us today? Right. And yes, there are definitely economic stories to be told about stealing from the rich to give to the poor, that type of hero. But like, what does it mean when you're in a sort of medieval economy of, you know, lordship 
and being tied to the land and, be, and like fiefdoms right, right. versus being in a capitalistic market. Those are going to be two different types of heroes. Right. And I think it's okay for that hero to respond to the culture that it's in. Because, well, in essence, also, like, if you're in a modern, you know, financial context reading the traditional one it's like oh that's interesting but it doesn't connect as well Mm -hmm. and so if you want something you know to retell something you want to make it something that like your modern audience can actually understand like in some senses like depending on how far back Mm -hmm. these stories go Mm -hmm. there are some things that are so foreign to our current culture that unless you do have a background in classicalism it's kind of like what why yeah you know and so changing them and updating them make them where you can kind of translate some of the same ideas, Mm -hmm. but in a context that makes sense to the modern reader and they can connect on Mm -hmm. some levels. Yeah, absolutely. So that is the song of Achilles. And also I'll give a shout out for Circe. Circe was also popular, but was never quite as popular. I feel like in either of the cycles that these books went through, I personally prefer Circe. I think it's a quite a couple steps up from the Song of Achilles. So if you're interested in classical mythology, if you're interested in retellings, I would say start with Circe, but I wanted to give a shout out to the Song of Achilles because it's definitely a forerunner in terms of being popular this year. All right. And how long has that one actually been out? Um, I think she came out with it a couple years after the Song of Achilles. So they've probably both been out maybe eight years or something like that. This is the power of the internet. Right. I mean, like I've actually known authors who like had completely finished like 20 book series and like gone on to the next one and all of a sudden like because of tiktok yeah you know they're a bestseller on this series that they'd kind of been like oh that was the thing i wrote for fun you know (laughs) and it's like i think i saw one author who was like you know she went out to lunch with her mom and her mom was like did you know that your books are popular on this thing called book talk (laughs) (laughs) i wonder if it's a little bit like oh if you've like moved past it or maybe if you feel like oh it's not your best work anymore you've outgrown it if it's a little bit like well thanks but do you want to read the stuff that i read recently yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's kind of like um that's i mean i know in in the case of this author she's kind of had to like go back and write in that world again Mm -hmm. um and like i don't feel like those books are as good as the original ones that she put out and i think it's because she's like trying to be like okay fans here's some more of that world but her heart's not there anymore right you know her heart had left that world before it even became popular she kind of just had like a small cult following yeah i also want to now take some time to complain about another book that's had like a second a second wave, a second wind. And this is the Akatar series. So I actually read the first two books in that series right around the first time they were popular, which would have been like 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. That just seems like a completely different world. Like, you know, we were different people in 2015. I was a different person. And I actually, before I sort of talk about these books and what I think uh, my, some of my complaints about them, I want to like take some time to set myself up as a, as a reader, which is that I had graduated from college in 2010 uh, with my English degree and was completely burnt out on reading. So I just didn't read for about two years at all, which has never happened to me in my life. I was That's, a child reader. Yeah. I read my through my entire life. I always loved the English, got my English degree. But I'm, by the time you finish your university degree... I'm just like, wait, there was... There was a, a period t- where you didn't read? Yes, it was very it was very uh, disturbing, but I needed to take a break. And when I was finally ready to come back to reading, I actually came back with Harry Potter because it was a childhood favorite like it was for many people of around my age. Right. And it mm-hmm. helped me to ease back in. And I also went back to a couple of other like teen books that I had read. Like I've talked about Sarah Dessen to you before. It's right. like a she was really popular for girls who probably grew up around my age as like a YA author. Um, and so I went back and read some of her books and that kind of got me then in the realm of like reading YA that was coming out at that time. And obviously like Twilight had been a huge thing. And I feel like on the, in the world stage of the internet, we had read Twilight, loved Twilight, the movies came out. And then we had like this deconstruction period where we were like, wait, there are there's some really legitimate criticisms to be made about this right, book. Right, Some perhaps problematic things. Right. And <laughs> which it's okay to consume problematic con- media, but it, I think it's really helpful if you do so with a level of self-consciousness and awareness around. And it's okay to be like, oh, I like this thing, but now as a more mature person, I'm mm-hmm. like, maybe I need to like think about this more. Yeah. And so obviously one of the main core criticisms of 
Twilight is the way that it romanticizes what is essentially an abusive and controlling relationship in right, the two main right. characters. And that's one thing to put forth to an adult audience who may consciously choose to to read that in a romance novel. It's another thing to put that forth to a young teen audience right. and set that up as an ideal without any sense of this is not being endorsed by the book. Right. Not analyzing that all, mm -hmm. not, you know, talking about... I think that one of the main things that issues with like that type of story is not honestly looking at what that does to the person who's being controlled. Mm -hmm. That yeah. kind of just gets like washed away and like, it's totally fine because like right. he cares about me. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm perfectly fine with stories that portray darker relationships with the like real uh, consequences. Yeah. With the uh, honest, like, ex you know, examination of like what this looks like on both partners. Mm -hmm. But with, yeah, in a lot of like more younger fiction, it's not, yeah. There's no, there's not a, a real deep look at the relationship in general because mm -hmm. that's not really something that's done, yeah. you know, in romance novels for young readers or, you know, young readers in general. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get the opportunity to be like, yeah. well, is this really good? Or, yeah. You know, is this really going to work out? Yeah. And I think, you know, what made me really frustrated about A Court of Thorns and Roses and it's you know, series, which I only read the first two books, so I can't truly comment on the rest of the series, is that right as we were finishing up the commentary about how that was a really problematic relationship, we come out with Akatar, and you see that same kind of dynamic displayed mm. through the characters. And I'm not just talking about the relationship that was displayed in the first book, who she doesn't end up being with, but he's controlling and abusive, and it's set up as being romantic and idealized, mm. but even the guy that she totally ends up being with also has so many problematic elements to their relationship, I would say, particularly emotionally manipulative and abusive. Mm -hmm. And it's to have that book come out right after we were just talking about <laughs> this, guys, and to ha watch people, you know, go from, oh yeah, Twilight is kind of bad, that is a problem, to, oh my god, Akatar, was very frustrating for me as like a reader and as a viewer of the content well, that was coming Well, and I out. think we have to remember too, like in the midst of this mm -hmm. was also Fifty Shades of Grey based on right. the Twilight, and like the, like, which was, had this like rise of popularity, and then the movie came out, and mm -hmm. it came out to like an even wider audience, yeah. and the discussion started to be like, wait, this is not... Right. Like right. there's something wrong here. This is, they're portraying this as this particular community and that's not how that, that community, community operates. operates. Yeah, yeah. Like that's actually just straight up abuse. Right. So we were having like all of these conversations and then right. hit that wall. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's one of the frustrations that I have around, and you know, this is frustrations for me. I don't know that anybody else has to solve this for me, but like everybody's going to be on their own path in their reading journey. But I do feel like as we have these sort of surges and then resurgences of certain types of books on booktube and on t book talk and all of that, I feel it sometimes feels like I'm caught in an infinity loop of we've had yeah. this conversation before. Right, right. We have already like, why can't we get past this as a society? Which it's like, Obviously, it's unreasonable for me to accept, expect every reader who comes fresh to these stories to have the maturity or the background of criticism or the same experiences that I had right. by the time I got to these stories. But it, I don't know. It, am I? Do you? Do no, you know I, I totally know what you're talking about. And I sometimes I just feel like we're we're like a month away from 2024. Yeah. You know, like I felt like. Like there's so many of these things were things that were coming up as I was going through like a young mm -hmm. adult phase. Yeah. And I kind of got this sense of like, yay, we're like working this out mm -hmm. and like things are going to be better. And yeah. like now we're a month away from 2024 and we're still having these conversations. We're like, yeah. is that abusive? Is that manipulative? Or could it be conceived mm -hmm. as protective? You know, mm -hmm. and stuff. And it's like, no guys, that's just abusive. Yeah. That's just manipulation. <laughs> and I also want to talk about the justification of a powerful male character who is often much older, you know, they're these more, immortal more elves or whatever, supposedly more mature with a much, much, I mean, it's just got pedo written all over it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but with this much, much younger romantic interest, who's a human, who's vulnerable, you know, whether it's to a vampire, to an elf or whatever, you know, whatever you want to say. But this articulation for the male love interest to have this dark and tragic past as a justification for his bad mm. behavior. And that yeah. is another thing that I am just, I feel like it's almost like these books are textbook. You're, you're priming young girls to get into a relationship with someone who's like, 
I'm a narcissist who knows how to spin a really sad and, yeah. you know, manipulative story about my ex and my previous life and whatever I did. And I'm going to love bomb you and get you into this. Re- I mean, it's literally like putting onto the page, like the cycle that we see where, of what narcissistic partners do in romance. Well, and it also like, it gives you this sense of like, we can, we can forgive a, a, a negative behavior if someone has a terrible past. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, no, if someone's harming someone else, it's, it's wrong no matter what their past was. Mm-hmm. No matter what's causing someone to harm someone mm-hmm. does not negate the harm done. Mm-hmm. 100%. So I just like, I get really frustrated with these books. And again, I, I think there's always room for someone to read and enjoy what they want to read and enjoy. But don't tell me it's good. Don't tell me it's well written. Don't tell me that, you know, I, if you're saying like, oh, this is my Snickers bar and it is really enjoyable for me to read. 100% I get that. But don't try to convince me it's like some, yeah, a a five course meal that with balanced macros. Okay. (laughs) With fresh organic veggies. Like that's not what's happening here. And especially if you're an adult coming into this, you know, reading this YA book I just, I have a really hard time with it. I'm, I'm really frustrated by it. And the other thing that frustrates me is like, I have read and enjoyed a lot of children's literature. I've read and enjoyed a lot of middle grade literature. And then we get, it's like, there's this thing where like YA happens where suddenly I feel like the quality tanks. I have experienced that so much. Yeah. And there are actually like, like middle grade books that yeah. I've read. Like I've talked about the series of unfortunate events. Yeah. I read that as an adult and I thought it was fantastic. Right. I, there's never a time where I felt like, Oh, like we're reading children's books, you mm-hmm. know, which obviously the children are the main protagonists. They yeah. are experiencing things that children experience right. and they're trying to like, you know, cope with the problems that are facing in, them. Uh, yeah. In like childhood, like ways and like with their limited understanding and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But they are written so fantastic that yeah. I just, I love them. And there mm-hmm. was, I mean, there's also like, I think a fair amount of stuff in there where I think that would just like go over a child's head. And I feel like he right. was acknowledging that like parents probably are going to have to read these with their kids or want to read these before their kids read them. And so he, the author is like acknowledging that and being Reaching like, both audiences. yeah, like not being like, well, too bad for you, yeah. you know? Um, but I, I have, like, I've read them also like the mysterious mm-hmm. Benedict society, which mm-hmm. is a, a middle grade book. I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I know he's kind of a problematic author in himself, but there have been a couple of things that, was, um, Orson Scott Card has read that mm-hmm. I've been uh, ri- written that I've enjoyed. Mm-hmm. But then every time I read young adult fiction, I'm like, and it's do like, we get like, do we lose brain cells? Is that yeah. what we're trying to say? Like 11 year olds seem smarter right now. <laughs> I just think it's really unfortunate that like, we end up with YA literature that I think is actually typically quite low quality. It's like, there's no reason why we can't have stories that are fantasy and speculative and have romantic storylines or whatever the case may be, but you know, they could be, you know, set in modern times and are realist. Right. But like, there's no reason why we can't have books that are really excellent that are intended for this audience. And I, and it's I have also a little bit of a talking down to mm-hmm. the audience. Like, yeah. Oh, I know you can't like read this well. So right. we're going to simplify Like that's always something I feel like when I'm reading young adult fiction, cause I've tried multiple times cause it's so popular on the internet, even amongst people my age level. Right. I keep trying cause yeah. I'm like, I'm missing something here. <laughs> like why it must be something here. Right. But right. That's often when I feel like is the writing itself is talking down to me and suggesting that I don't have the reading capacity mm-hmm. of just like an average adult. Yeah. And I, and I am able to like kind of distinguish like those moments when it's like, Oh, this isn't resonating with me because it's not, cause I'm not the intended audience right. for it in the same way as when I pick up children's literature and I say, okay, like these characters who are 10 don't resonate with me because I'm not 10 years <laughs> yeah, old yeah. anymore. I can see the difference between that experience and the experience of like, just being like, why is this kind of crummy? You know, yeah. why is it kind of badly written? Why is it that these characters, why are you articulating these romance frameworks in the basically the framework of an ideal abuser. Like why would you be putting, the, cause you as the author have the power to make these characters different. Well, and also like this, there's kind of like this idea of like, you know, 
to have like a strong male character, he has to be domineering or he has to be yeah. controlling and we just call it protective. Like mm-hmm. you can have like a very masculine male character mm-hmm. who still cares and mm-hmm. is, you know, kind and yeah. doesn't need to control. Like yeah. we just like auto assume this. And to me that's really like kind of a teenager mindset. Yeah. Like it's an immature idea that like strong men are controlling and you just have mm-hmm. to accept that. And it's like right. the people who are writing these things should know better. Like right. you're not a teenager. Yeah. So anyway, that's like me complaining about Akatar for 30 minutes. Do you want to bring us back up a little bit? Uh, (laughs) In a totally other vein. (laughs) So my last book I'm going to bring up is actually, I feel like not popular on the internet right now. And that is Dune. It's popular across time. It's been a huge hit over time. So I have to say like this is been kind of elevated to like probably like my second favorite book of all time we all know what my first favorite book is we had an entire podcast on that (laughs) (laughs) but um this is probably my second and i like barely knew anything about it until the film came out Mm -hmm. i saw the trailer it is a fantastic trailer and i was like i want to read that book which is pretty good Mm -hmm. if you can sell me to read a book just on the movie trailer so um i got an audiobook version of it Loved it so much. My husband got me this like super fancy, Mm -hmm. pretty version with footnotes and everything for Christmas. And speaking of books that like read in print versus read on audio, I know you've recommended to me reading it on audio. I think that audio is a good place for you to start with Mm -hmm. a book like this. Um, But I feel like that with like a lot of fantasy books. Um, But I did go back and read it as a physical book and loved it just as much Mm -hmm. as a physical book. Like I feel like I got it because it's a pretty hefty book. Yeah. So I love this book. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm coming into that conversation. But also, I, I'm a modern reader who, mm-hmm. you know, didn't have any context going into, like, what was this book about? You know, right. like, I just was like, oh, this book is suddenly back in the spotlight because mm-hmm. the film is being made. And so I just picked it up. I see so many people on the internet rip this book apart. Mm-hmm. And it aggravates me so much, not because, like, oh, this is my favorite book, so you should like it. Mm-hmm. It's the reason they they do it. And I like, I don't want to be mean, but sometimes I'm like people. Yeah. Stop like advertising yourself this way. (laughs) Yeah. Because they'll say like, it's hard to read. So it's a bad book. Yeah. This book is not hard to read. I had someone literally say that to me about Shakespeare. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. First of all, if a book even, okay, let's just stop it. Yeah. Even if a book is hard, that doesn't make it bad. Right. That is a completely different thing. There are certainly books that are extremely complex. The language is very different than what we are mm-hmm. accustomed to. Mm-hmm. You know, it's requiring a higher level of thought process. That doesn't make it bad. Mm-hmm. Starting there. Like, yeah. I hate that attitude of like, this book was like, you know, a little harder than a YA book. So Mm -hmm. it's bad. Well, and the other thing too is that like how difficult a book is for you to read, if you're a reader for your entire life, is going to change over time. Right. So did the quality of the book change or did you become a better reader over time? Yeah. How can you make such a universal statement as though it's an objective truth when it's so very subjective to your personal experience in a given moment? I mean, one thing I like regularly hear people complain about is the names. First of all, I'm always just like... Which one's hard for you, Paul or Jessica? <laughs> <laughs> but like, also, that's complete BS. Like, I've, well, I've, there read, are, fan- like, I've read fantasy novels yeah. for modern times. All fantasy authors mm-hmm. come up with these wild names, yeah. and that's just a part of the thing. So to be like, well, Dune's bad because the names are hard. It's like, well, then all fantasy books are bad because the names are hard. Like, right. that's not the reason you're struggling with Dune. Yeah. Let's stop doing that. Right. But. Yeah, I, I, I need people, like, in a way to understand, like, like there's this, like, concept over and over again, like, this book can't be read. It's too hard. Mm-hmm. When this book came out originally, it was the first science fiction book to be popular with a completely wide audience. Mm-hmm. Like, readers from all genres were yeah. able to read this book. Mm-hmm. So it's not impossible to read. Mm-hmm. Generations have been able to read this book just fine yeah. but for some reason it's so popular to get on the internet and be like it's a really hard book mm-hmm. so we shouldn't be reading it and i'm just yeah. like okay first of all like you're kind of outing your reading skills yeah. like what what are you doing they don't i mean I, I will actually like end up a lot of times in the comment threads people will be like you really shouldn't be like admitting this book is hard yeah. <laughs> but like also just 
the frustration I feel where people are just like, well, you know, it's a bad book. Mm -hmm. Also, like I saw one person was like, oh, this book is about the Cold War and we're all so past that. So there's no point in reading it. It's like, okay, first of all, this book is about colonialism, not the Cold War. Like Mm -hmm. reading comprehension, my dear. (laughs) (laughs) But the idea that like, oh, because it's about something in the past, we shouldn't read it, which is like straight up what she was like. Oh, it's about a past Mm -hmm. event. So don't read it. Yeah. Even that, like, like, that's ridiculous. That is a yeah. ridiculous mindset to have. First of all, if you're reading fantasy novels, what does that have to do with anything in our time era? Yeah. But you'll read fantasy novels, but now mm-hmm. it's like, oh, well, this book is a fantasy novel about something that happened in the past. Mm-hmm. So it's negated now. Yeah. Like, these are all very, very bad reading habits that mm-hmm. people have. And I hate when, like, it becomes, like, this universal, like, oh, and now we're going to tear this thing down together mm-hmm. because... I I can't connect with it or I can't read it or I'm going to judge it because for some reason, like in romantic fantasy, characters can have really bizarre (laughs) names, but in science fiction, that makes me angry. (laughs) Yeah. That's yeah. Very, very silly. So let's give your defense for this book. And who do you think is the ideal reader for a book like this? Who, what do you really love about it? And who do you think it would connect with? Honestly, like, this is an extremely plot-driven novel. Mm -hmm. Like, I will be be honest with you, I don't actually think this is, like, some great work of, like, literature. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very plot-driven novel. Yeah. And it picks up very, very quickly. And as someone who just likes genre fiction, Mm -hmm. this is, like, a perfect book for that. Yeah. It does have a more um, opaque storytelling, which Mm -hmm. I like. I don't want, as we've just (laughs) said, I don't want my my author to like tell me what the world is and then go I want to discover the world as I walk through it and Mm -hmm. that is the style Mm -hmm. and I guess that that may be same (laughs) there I I almost put out this video on my YouTube um and I tried to do it on TikTok as well where I was like okay these are the types of authors that I really don't connect with and it's because they have so much exposition right and it's like if I pop open this book and in the intro chapters which is supposed to be your hook chapter I'm like given this flood of exposition. I it makes me want to peel my skin off. Like I, know, I, I hate I, that. Like I don't come to your house and go, oh, I'm knocking on the door of my very good friend Emily's house. <laughs> and we met in this and this year, and that's because our you know parents were gonna, but you know or whatever. Like yeah. I don't think about our backstory actively in my head as certain mm-hmm. actions are happening. Right, right. And and I find it like sitcoms do it a lot, where they have to put like these exposition lines into like. You know, and it's so awkward. I just hate it. Oh, hey, mom, I got to go hang out with my cousin Jimmy tonight. You know, and you're just like, nobody says my cousin Jimmy. Right. She, she knows the mom who Jimmy. already knows. It's her nephew. You know, we all know who Jimmy is in this household. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's just one of, I'm sorry to hijack. That's all right. Tell us what's good about him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that is like the style of plot line where. Yeah you are walking through the world and like get building it bits and bits and off, you know, with the comments people make and things like that. Like for instance, like there's just a comment about the character reading like this very old book that he found called the orange Catholic Bible. And isn't it interesting? Like that we Mm -hmm. still have like a few examples of these books and nothing else is said about that, but you understand from the way it's written that like, like Catholicism is like a relic now, like that these, like these religions that to us are very like, you know, Present. present yeah has become something that they just look at as like a relic yeah. but there's no like and we look at this as a relic it's more just like the characters reading the book and finds it interesting and then you know puts it away and it's not yeah. you know there's no like exposition of like catholicism ran you know went away and this year and that year mm-hmm. like you're not even really sure like what time area you're in here it's just the sense of like the oh, future <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, but yes, very, very plot driven, Mm -hmm. um, very fast moving plot. I find like, it's literally like, (laughs) some people like, oh, it's slow. I'm like, the character like gets out of bed and is immediately brought in front of like, you know, some like mysterious figure who immediately threatens to kill him and gives him this puzzle that he has to solve. Otherwise he's dying. I'm like, how is that slow? (laughs) Explain that to me. Yeah. It's, I feel like really an interesting book too, in terms of like where we are culturally, because Frank Herbert was a ecologist Mm -hmm. and a lot of the book is a discussion of like the destruction of the environment Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. pursuit of 
you know, A, B, and C. Yeah, exploiting it for extracting yeah. resources. And not under, like, not thinking about long term, like, what that was going to cause. And mm-hmm. So there's, like, a lot of discussions about that, which I think are very prescient to the day, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the discussions that for some reason are going on today, which is kind of yeah. funny. You're like, Brown, this book was written in the 60s and we're in 2024 and we're still yeah. having these conversations. So I think that makes it very relevant yeah. in the discussion they're having. It's also very obviously, you know, a look at colonialism. I, I think it's really interesting the way that he chooses to like each family house of nobility in the mm-hmm. story to me is very clearly a different like nation in time. Yeah. Uh, so like Paul's family is clearly like a mid- medieval Europe, mm-hmm. whereas like the Harkonnen house is clearly Roman, the mm-hmm. Roman Empire. You know, and the the to me the Emperor's house has got like some dynastic China vibes to it. Mm-hmm. And so like I love all this stuff because you're like oh like. I think I know where that comes from. And, mm-hmm. Oh, I can see that influence there. You know, mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. I think it's a really fun book. Yeah. Um, and really interesting. Yeah. And so when I just see people who are just like, oh, it's so hard to read. Don't tell people to read this book. I, I literally saw someone who was like, oh, a friend of mine was recommended to read Dune. And I was like, don't do that. And I'm like, what? Let, let her read Dune. Like, leave her alone. Yeah. If someone likes Dune and they told her they like Dune, like, leave it alone. Why do you yeah. have to be in there like, no. Yeah. Don't read that book. Mm-hmm. Hi, leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The internet is a weird place. The internet is a weird place. You really do figure out, in case it wasn't already obvious, how unique we all are. <laughs> <laughs> and how wrong everybody... No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right, you're wrong, the end. <laughs> I mean, I certainly don't think that, like, if, you, if you're on the internet being like, I like this book, like, that's fine. Yeah. You like that book. I do find it really interesting, like what culturally grabs like that Mm -hmm. moment in the sun and it's often just a moment you know like where this book will just explode Mm -hmm. or even like television series and like for a moment we're all just watching or reading this thing Mm -hmm. and then it's gone yeah you know and it kind of becomes like a game of like does this author survive to the next book yeah or was that their moment in you know the sun and now we've set and we've moved on to someone entirely different Mm -hmm. and i think that's like a fascinating cycle to watch because it's just like sometimes i'm like oh i totally get like janice how i totally get yeah why she's having a moment right now yeah because her books are very fresh and they're very well written Mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't get those two sometimes you get one or the other you know but other books i'm like why yeah what what is it? You know, yeah. like it almost becomes kind of like a detective thing where I'm trying to read it, trying to figure out like right. what it is. Yeah. And to go back to like the Twilight Akitar conversation, I, f- I feel that way too, where it's like, it's, and I do think that this is kind of an important question to bring to bear on things that are popular. And even when you don't like those things or even, you know, obviously like I have my criticisms, but it isn't just enough for me to say, oh, they're bad and you shouldn't like them. Okay, well then, why is it that that type of story captures the hearts and minds of people over and over again? Why is it that if Twilight's not there, then Akatar's there, then, you know, I would say Colleen Hoover, some of her books fall into that same category. So I've heard, I haven't actually read them myself. But it's sort of like, okay, well then, what is it about what exists inside of us or exists inside of our culture that makes these stories so compelling to the general audience? That we keep coming back. And they make, they're compelling in a way that is very... um, you know, on a very unconscious way. Right. So I don't know. I think there's still something to be said there because like when you see something like a twilight, which obviously went even beyond, you know, really what Akatar has done where it captured the hearts and minds of teenagers, of women, right. of mothers, of women in their forties. It was, you know, such a huge cultural phenomenon. We're doing this Edward versus Jacob thing. Well, and honestly, like, I feel like if we hadn't had Twilight and the, the, you know, mm-hmm. explosion that it was, we wouldn't still be reading young adult novels yeah. as like 40 year olds. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like that established a new like, way. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And, and so then it's like, well, what is it about what older women are looking for in YA, that they're getting in YA, that they're not getting in adult romance, right. which is a whole nother conversation. It's just a, you know, there's interesting questions that I don't quite know how to answer, partially because I feel so emotionally disconnected from whatever it is that they're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's just like that, you know, that one passed me by, but you know, and I'm not trying to take away someone's enjoyment of it either by being a, you know, negative Nancy, if you will. But like, you know, I do, I do find it interesting. I do find it odd. 
Yeah. Well, I've even like had like people kind of be stunted by this whole idea of popular book on the internet because mm -hmm. they try to read the most popular book on the internet. They're not like a particularly like big reader, but mm -hmm. they're like, everybody's reading this book. So mm -hmm. I have to read this book to be into it. And then it's not a good book. And maybe I just don't like it. Like mm -hmm. I've literally had people be like, Oh, I tried reading, you know, such and such popular book and I didn't like it. And I just don't think I'm a reader because everybody was into it and mm -hmm. I just did not get it. And I'm like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't define you. Yeah. You know, like sometimes also like there is a level of hype where like everybody likes this. So I have to like this mm -hmm. and it doesn't make that book good. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't make people who don't like the book bad, like right. not readers just because like we should be mm -hmm. way more free to be like, oh, I didn't like that. Yeah. Or I did like that. I mean, I've had like seen so many book talk videos start with now don't get mad at me. I know. I just didn't like this book. Like what? Yeah. No, stop that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. I do think, you know, there's, I personally enjoy as a reader is like being able to track my progress. And like one example that I frequently give is that I bought the novel Anna Karenina, I think after I graduated high school. So I was like 18 or 19 when I picked it up. And, um, I tried reading it like three or four times over yeah. the course of the years and it just sat on my shelf and I couldn't read it because it's a challenging book. Mm -hmm. And then like by the fifth time that I sat down to try and read it, and this was maybe 2020, I finally like I connected. I was a strong enough reader to really engage with the work. I was able to keep track of this vast family. And then I actually like found it to be a page turner. And I was like, oh my God, I can't put down Tolstoy. Like I'm, yeah. I'm like blasting through this like ridiculous novel. And then it allowed me to have the opportunity to be like, wow, look at how much I've grown since I was 19. Now I'm in like my mid thirties. I really have grown as a reader. I have absolutely experienced that. You know, like I, this is not anything near Tolstoy. But, um, for me, like that, for that first, like round of realizing that was for, um, Wilkie Collins, the Milk Moonstone, yeah. which I tried to read as a younger reader and just got like kind of frustrated and like, you know, burnt yeah. out on it. And the reality is at that time I was like very plot driven, like anything, mm -hmm. like it just needed to be about the plot. And that book is actually like really like a lot of vignettes of characters mm -hmm. and the plot somewhere in there, you know? Mm -hmm. And the second time I just, I tried to read it cause I was like, it, it's such it's kind of like the supposedly the first like true mystery novel as a mystery reader. Like I always wanted to like kind of experience it. And the second time I read it, like I was like, I don't even care about the plot. I just want to know these characters more and enjoy the characters and enjoy the writing of it. And I realized like that's a big step forward for me that like, you know, I didn't have to like have my hand held through a plot line mm -hmm. to like a book. Mm -hmm. And I think these are important experiences to have as yeah. readers. Yeah. And I, and I wonder, for the reader and again everybody can have different reading goals and if one of your reading goals is just to enjoy what you're reading that's a wonderful goal to have mm -hmm. but i do wonder for the sort of reader who started reading ya when we were teenagers with twilight and you're now in your mid-30s like me and you're still as in a grown adult woman relying on ya as your go-to genre and your go-to age group right like you're, I feel like you, maybe you're missing opportunities to grow and challenge yourself as a reader. And then also to grow and challenge your worldview and perspective, especially if you're consuming this type of content sort of unfiltered and uncritically, you know, to have the same, cause then I'm like, well, I don't want to be as the same type of person or with the same amount of wisdom as I was when I was 18. I want to be a right. wiser and deeper person than I was when I was 18. Well, and also like a lot of these books are extremely similar, mm -hmm. especially like a lot of times in like setting and context yeah. and plotline. And that was something for me about like, I don't know, like four or five years ago, I realized like I was kind of stuck in like a rut of genre. Mm -hmm. Like I was reading one genre <laughs> <laughs> and I realized like, I don't want to be that person anymore. And so I like made a conscious effort to just like, read things from like as many different like types of, and I, I like, that's honestly what I do now is like, I read like every different mm -hmm. genre and it's fantastic. And I was missing out. Yeah. Like as someone who kind of just got stuck in a genre, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of like, Oh, I'm judging myself for this. I was missing things. Yeah. Like there's a, a whole world of books out there right. that if you get stuck in a genre, you miss. Yeah. And f even for me, which I would say like I was stuck in classics for a really long time. I've missed out on things by reading the quote unquote good books or the quote unquote right books. Right. Um, and so, you know, this past year I've made a huge list of various authors and works in translation that are not American literature, not British literature, you know, so that I can 
And, it, and no matter what you read, if you read the same things over and over again, it's going to get stale. And I found that to be true, right. even as a classics reader, which there's still a huge amount of variety within that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I've been drinking these books in that are like from Japan and Korea and China. I've been focusing on Asian literature because they just feel so refreshing, so yeah, innovative, yeah, like, you know, and it just like, it makes, it, it reinvigorated my reading life. Yeah, it honestly... I, I feel like making choices like that, it doesn't just make you a a better reader. It makes reading more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Like I read a lot more than I used to making yeah. the choice to diversify because like there's, I've suddenly realized like how many books there are out there and I'm excited to like try a right. book in this genre, try this new author, try just, mm -hmm. just try as much as there is out there because like that's what makes reading fun for me. And yeah. sometimes I do like, I get hung up on this one author who has like 50 books and sure, I will read about 30 of them. Yeah. But then, you know, I take a deep dive in some in an entirely different zone, you know? Yeah. And it's just, for me personally, made reading really fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm gonna complain about one more book. Do it. Before we wrap this up in the year of our Lord 2023. <laughs> Cause it's, it's not a podcast unless we complain a little bit. And so I wanna talk about the Atlas Sticks. That's right. <laughs> That's right, another extremely popular book in this year that I, I did, had a hard time connecting with, also YA. But, okay, so I wanted to pick this book up, obviously, because Dark Academia. I'm really attracted to that genre, and I have found that I am, like, more attracted to what I think the genre could be than what it ends up actually being for mm. many of these books. And part of it is because it's probably YA, and so I'm having a hard time connecting with right. it. Yada, yada. Okay, but I want to complain about something specifically that the Atlas Six does, and I find that it's true for like a lot of movies as well, or TV shows. Um, and that is when you have a cast of characters, but because there's so many characters, you end up, instead of dealing with them in a sophisticated and robust way, they all become flat. They mm. all end up being like the one who does XYZ with ABC motivation. Right. And I just can't... <laughs> I would say that I'm primarily a character-driven person anyway. I tend to prefer character-driven books to plot-driven books. Um, and so if you give me not just one, but six flat characters, I'm going to hate it. <laughs> okay? Not for me. Um, and so The Atlas Six is a story where you have a cast of students who are coming in, and they're all kind of being vetted to get into this very elite institution that's sort of magical. And so each one comes in with their own magic style and they get very much reduced down to like cliches and archetypes. One of them is like the sexy girl who just like, is like, I'm willing to sleep my way to the top. <laughs> Man, woman, mineral, vegetable, I put it in my hoo-ha. <laughs> and then like one of them is like, I'm angry because I was hurt and now my plant magic will kill you. And like, and then that's all that, you know, there's like not any character development is really. Even if you have a plot driven novel, you still yeah. have to have character right. development, okay? Yeah. Do we not know this? No, we don't. Okay. No. Anyway, it drives also, me can crazy. Can we just like stop with the school, the magic yeah. school? Like, can we just like take a break from the school? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's we, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that was my last one to complain about, and you know, and I would say, even though. <laughs> I don't know why I enjoy the Wheel of Time series. Apparently it's bad, but I've had a lot of fun with it on Amazon. But I will admit that's another situation where you have a cast of characters, which one's the dragon? And they have these very specific like character traits and motivations and they always make the same choice. And you're like, I've been hanging out with these characters for like 14 hours, which encompassed about six years of their lives. I'm sure they've grown and matured and changed over time. It's not just the one who's like, oh, I'm supposed to protect you, so I feel bad when any of them die. Come on, we can have another <laughs> motivation. We can have complex motivations that operate within that. It's okay. The reality is that's who humans are. We right. do not always face things from like one black and white. Okay, yeah. we almost never face things from one black and white stance. Right. Well, I think that that kind of comes down to like what we've been talking about with like some of the issues with young adult fiction. Um, because that is kind of like a childish way to look at things. And like, legitimately, that's how you, cr you, you have to like kind of grow into the realization mm -hmm. that like we all have complex motivations. Like mm -hmm. as a child, you are a little more easily but, fall I mean, into like, like, you can look at a book, like, let's just take a look at like the, the, 
Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first Narnia book, right? And we see, like, Edmund coming in, and he's a little bit of a deceitful character, and mm. he lies about, he gets into Narnia, and he lies about seeing it with Lucy or whatever, but we see, like, that he has complex motivations, which some of them are that he wants to have the approval of his older brother and sister. Mm. Some of it is that he's looking for attention. It's not just, he's the bad one. Right, You right. know, And this so even in, like, child literature, we see the complexity of these motivations come to we the fore. We just, like, characters. lose that all in young adult. Yeah. <laughs> So, anyway. Teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> they must be dumb. And I'm like, I, there is part of me that's like, do these YA authors, like, not like teenagers? I know. Yeah. You resent your audience? I yeah. don't know. I, yeah. I mean, that that is the weird thing about young adult fiction is it is being written by adults mm -hmm. looking at this world from, like, supposedly a teenager's perspective. And a lot of times that that is my issue with young adult fiction because I'm like, well, I don't... Yes, I cared about these things at 16 because I was a silly 16-year-old. So mm -hmm. as, like, you know, a person in their, you know, late 30s, early 40s, I, I know that we all need to just get over that. So I'm not, like, interested in, in going back to my 16-year-old obnoxious self, mm -hmm. you know. But a lot of times it's kind of just, like, yeah, like, you're you're kind of looking down on teenagers and making fun of them and treating them like they're not very smart, you yeah. know. Yeah, which then, by contrast, I'm going to go back to Song of Achilles, which is a very smart book written a, for, with the understanding that in, teenagers are very intelligent, referencing great literature and doing it in a really sophisticated way with great and complex characters. It can, it be, can, done. Done. <laughs> it can be done. So that, I'm going to stop complaining right there. <laughs> until, until next time. We'll see you guys next year. We'll be back. <laughs> We've covered the internet. Yeah. We've done that today. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, to end on a Christmassy note, maybe pick up the Christmas appeal if you and want a little. And then just like get people the appeal for Christmas. It's yeah. an excellent gift. I have given this book as a gift. I've been like, you need this in your life. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I actually got that as a gift for someone before I ever bought it for myself because I was like, oh, this is, I know. It's just a fun thing. Yeah. It's just a fun and it's, it's, there are absolutely fast reads. Like yeah. it's not asking someone to do it. When someone gives you like a gigantic book and it's just like, mm -hmm. I can't give this much of my life to your preferences. Yeah. <laughs> but this oh. is just like a very quick read for sure. Yeah. So l final question. This is off the cuff, un unprepared. Ooh. A couple of bookish gift recommendations for our audience. If you're listening and you want to get a gift for a, a bookish friend in your life. Go. Oh man. I mean, I, I mean, let's be honest, like the first thing is like a gift card to Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> right. Like if your people like buying books, you know, let them buy books. That's yes. always like an excellent, fun thing. I'm actually asking for Christmas a, um, a book protector because mm -hmm. I like to bring books with me, but then I get really aggravated because like when I go out because like the co you know, cover gets, gets crunched or a corner more, gets like, and then, and then I don't take books with me and then I'm sitting in a lobby for an hour mm -hmm. and I'm like, why didn't I bring a book with me? So yeah. I am asking for like one of those sleeves that you can yeah. put your book in to carry it with me for sure. Yeah. I might also be asking for some fan of the opera writing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. A thing that's available on the internet. <laughs> Thank goodness for the internet. There's this yeah. site, okay, there's this site called Story Art. Um, mm -hmm. It's S T O R I Art. Mm -hmm. um, and they do like anything and everything related to like classical literature. Mm -hmm. but, like their big thing is they have like writing gloves for like mm -hmm. every like famous book that you can. And it's just like, it's one of those things that I've been wanting for like. 10 years and yeah. I've always told myself that silly and then this year I was like well someone else could buy it for me and then it wouldn't be as silly right yeah <laughs> that's what Christmas is for yeah so there are some very functional like book gifts that you can get people and then there are some things that are just fun and silly yeah. they have them for Jane Austen and Agatha Christie and Shakespeare <laughs> and whoever else is your favorite Ho whoever else you like yes yeah. how about you yeah I I would say yeah, definitely huge endorsement on the gift card. I know it's one of those things where people don't like giving gift cards because maybe it's not that thoughtful, but honestly, if you have a book person in your life, it's, thoughtful. it's extremely thoughtful because then they can get exactly the book that they want and make, you, you know, you don't know if maybe it's a duplicate or somebody already got them that book or they checked it out from the library and they've already read it. So it's actually very helpful for the reader in your yeah. life. Um, I would say an Audible subscription. I know you got it for oh, Christmas. Yeah, I time. always, I often ask for Audible gift cards because if you get someone an Audible gift card, it like just, it mm -hmm. just, if they have the account already, it just goes to more credits or it's a setup mm -hmm. for the account. 
And that is always a gift where I'm like, yeah. please give me more because I yeah. will always need more audiobooks. Yeah. Yeah. Or paying for someone's Kindle Unlimited. Right. Um, right. I have someone in my life who enjoys Kindle Unlimited. So that's always fun to get them credits on that or yeah. pay for their subscription. So those are, I like giving bookish gifts that like leave the door open for them to select whatever book that they want. Yeah, exactly. So those are great options. But I also have actually given people the appeal as a gift. If mm -hmm. I know that they are like a real big mystery lover mm -hmm. and usually like I'm pretty up on like what, because, because I feel the need to talk to everyone about books. I know what they've read. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, like if for mystery lovers in my life, I have gifted them the appeal yeah. because I feel like it's, it's kind of like a refreshing wave. If you are a, a long-standing mystery lover, mm -hmm. then it's like a just like a nice new fresh moment for mystery. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this last episode for the year of 2023. We hope you all have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Wonderful New Year's. Absolutely. And we will see you next year. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.